Luke chapter 22. We'll look at verse 45. Verse 45. I am nervous to preach this message. Uh, I get nervous all the time. I know that's hard to believe, but I always do. I take ver preaching very seriously. Uh, I really do. But the reason why I'm nervous on this one is because this is one of those, um, you might recall my advanced discipleship classes when I get on to some of those wisdom points, like humility, for example. But that's just one, and there's a several on my list. I'm going to try to give another one now, but do it in a preaching format. But this one will, be, will have to be taught for several weeks, one day in advanced discipleship class. It's about reactions, reactions. So I'm just going to give you a gist of it. It won't do it justice, but one of the sermons I'd highly recommend is uh, Pastor Dennis Knoll's sermon, Reactionary Theology. Yes. Yes. Now, that one is very, it, it, it's very fun, okay, when you hear it. It's very fun. You'll get a very good laugh, but there is so much wisdom behind it. And he only covered one level or a subset of this topic that I'm covering. So you have to realize that this subject is very important concerning about reactions that can go out of balance. I believe that's one of the key ingredients why men never learn from history. And when I study history, you know me, I study intensely the psychology, the sociology, the scientific results that come out from all historical patterns. So world history is still my favorite subject because it was very eye-opening with how I pastor today. Some of the stuff where I cover end times, those conspiracies and all that, it all comes from this history. And this topic, if everyone knew about this topic, they wouldn't repeat the cycle of history. And that's reactions. How new revolutions, new movements, new kingdoms and uh, rise and other kingdoms fall and new societies crumble has to do with reactions where they react to an event and then they see another group so then they react to the other extreme on that one and that person reacts gradually from what they laid out and then the other side would react extremely to that one so if that made any sense to you but I notice that chain of events it never fails it never fails it's what people react to from somebody else or from a situation or event that happened. So, I would like to just cover a little subset of that. And we'll look at Luke chapter 22 and verse 45. And uh, I keep saying that I'll try to abide by the time. And you know that I'm lying. You know that I'm lying when I say that. <laughs> so expect one of those types of sermons. Because this is a lot of information. But uh, this will go on for, this can go on for weeks if I were to do this. Uh, like I always say, it's a love or hate message, right? So if you really like that type of style that I do, you're going to really love it. If you don't like it, then, well, this is one of those messages. You have to suffer the little children, please. <laughs> suffer the child in me, please. Luke chapter 22 and verse 45. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow and said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest he enter into temptation. And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? When they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said unto the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders which were come to him, Be come out as against a thief with swords and staves. When I was daily with you in the temple, he stretched forth no hands against me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. Then took they him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house. And Peter followed afar off. This story is the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus was turned over to his enemies and Judas betrayed him. At this very event, I can see six sins that were committed in Gethsemane. Six reactions to take note of. 
And this will relate and connect to everything that I said to, at the beginning about people's reactions. And to be quite honest, uh, it's not just these six things. I can see a whole bunch of other things, but we'll cover only six here, and we'll see how the time goes. Uh, if I had it my way, I would like to title this uh, Reactionary Theology Part 2, Continuing Dennis Knoll's Sermon, but that's such a long title. I would, like to, I would like to title it Six Sins Committed in Gethsemane. Father God, will you fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and the cleansing of your blood. Lord, uh, my preparation, you know me, Lord, and I mean it, my preparation and my very preaching of it and my very study of it doesn't do it justice of how you want us to understand it, learn it, heard it preached, and to apply it on our lives. So you'll have to take over, God, and please just have the Holy Spirit speak to them, Lord. And I pray that uh, our own sensitivity, us getting offended, our own flesh, distractions and disruptions from the devil and other things. Some of us went through hard times and we got some bad things going on. I pray they will not, they will not interrupt the seriousness and the desire to apply this message. Lord, perhaps uh, what I said is not as great to some people, the importance. Perhaps some of the people might say, it's important, but it wasn't that important like Pastor emphasized it. If that's the case, I still pray it will be a blessing to them, Lord. And I pray that maybe that there are some people here who can see this level of importance with me, and they can make drastic changes in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. I believe the creation of every false doctrine is from false reactions. I believe that a lot of our sins that we commit is because of false reactions. I believe the reason why we are having trouble raising our next generations is because of our wrong reactions. I believe the fall of our current society and country is because of wrong reactions. And reactions are committed without realizing that they occurred. Reactions happen because we think it's innocent. Reactions happen because even though we know it's wrong, we don't think it's that big of a deal. Okay, I want to show you the serious weight of this. You have no idea that history, get this now, history is created by man's free will. Did you understand what I said? Man's free will creates our history. I know that God's dispensational plan and he's in charge of everything that happens in our universe, but you got to realize this, that God also keeps in mind with his divine plan the free choice of man, and hence he had every dispensation planned out. So you have to realize that our free choice, basically every word you say, every action you committed is so powerful, it's going to change all of history. Now, a very small example is your life. Didn't you know your life forever changed because one man decided out of his free choice to die on the cross for you. Wow. And not only that, listen, not only that, because of another person who was able to stand up for Bible-believing truth, not care what the critics say, and even though he was, uh, he was stigmatized and stereotyped and cut off by all the Bible scholars, this doctor, Dr. Peter S. Ruckman stood up and taught the Bible, preached the truth. And not only that, had it not been the decision of a Korean who ran away from the Communist Party in North Korea, crossed the river, and not only that, because of another man's free choice who decided to get saved, even though he didn't want to get saved, he, did, he wanted to live his whole life in sin, and because of a mother who made the free choice, Lord, this baby is yours, and because of that, this young man right here made the decision, I don't care if all my peers in my church go after the world, I want to decide to follow Jesus. And not only that, because I added a decision that I will pastor here, not any place else. Amen. That's how you got saved and that's how you got here. Do you understand the seriousness of this? Your life should be the very proof how choice, free will, 
makes reaction changes that change all of history. We also don't realize that the free choices that you're going to commit today is going to cause reactions that can change the history, get this now, the history of San Francisco Bay Area. Do you realize if you're not in church today, how will Bible believers around the world think about San Francisco Bay Area? Do you understand? You know what they can say now? There's a Bible-believing church in the Bay Area when they talk about San Francisco Bay Area. There's trade preaching, non-compromise, dispensational truth, King James onlyism. They sow it. They stand up against all the left-wingers. Do you realize they can say that today? This is serious. That's the introduction. You ready for the rest? Let's look at the first sin, first point. Verse 45 through 46. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow and said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. We know that verse the way to get out of temptation and your fleshly weaknesses is to watch and pray. That way you don't end up in temptation. And we know that. And Jesus preached to them three times and they still don't get that and they still repeat their sin just like we do. I mean, Jesus told us, watch and pray that you don't enter into temptation. We heard that more than three times from Jesus Christ. We heard that hundreds of times from the preaching of the Word of God. Yet, why do we still sleep in the Garden of Gethsemane? Because it's too easy. When your flesh feels heavy, you can't help but sleep. It's too easy to do it. It's not like when you close your eyes, the Lord's going to send you lightning down from heaven and say, Wake up, child! No, Jesus let temptation, let the heaviness of the flesh and everything that happened take advantage of those disciples and allow them to choose to sleep on the job and not pray. You know why? It's not only very easy to do, to sleep on the job, it's also, we have to understand, it's not only very easy to sleep on the job, but another reason is because it's something so small. It's not a big deal. You think we're going to yell at you? God's going to yell at you for sleeping because you couldn't help but sleep because Jesus Christ is praying for hours in the garden and your flesh can't help but get bored and you're tired. You worked in a hard day's job. You had so many things going on and you sleep. Isn't it easy to decide to sleep? God will understand. Jesus will understand. I mean, I got to sleep. I mean, Jesus didn't, like, spank them for sleeping. He's not like the Christian science weird cult organization where it is true that they will hit you if, you know, you sleep on Sunday. All right? Jesus is not some extreme cultist. God is not an extreme cultist. He will let you do what you want and let you pay the price for it. You know why it's easy for, not only is sin so easy, the world is so easy. Neglecting your spiritual duty, backsliding, even just a little bit, is so easy to do. It's because it's too innocent. It's not a big deal. Not only that, didn't you know the disciples, they didn't just sleep because they were just tired? They have a good, legitimate reason for sleeping, I think. Didn't you know that? I really believe they did. The verse gave you a clue. Notice the first verse that we looked at. It said they sleep for what? Why would they be sad when they sleep? Could it be because Jesus Christ told them that I'm going to go away from you? And he said that 
you're going to experience sorrow at John 16. He said that right before he went to Gethsemane. And Peter said, I want to defend you, Lord. No, no, I won't deny you. I, I won't let them crucify you. And Jesus said, no, you guys are going to let me do that. So they just experienced so much grief. When you as a disciple go through so much heavy grief, and even God tells you that, hey, it's not going to be easy. You will face sorrow. You're going to go through hard times. You're going to be stressed out. You're going to go through pain. When you go through hardship and then sin, the flesh and the world is so easy and even very innocent to do with your flesh feeling all that pain and sorrow, how are you not going to do that? sinful thing or that fleshly thing or that worldly thing i mean what are you gonna do you put up with the pain put up with the sorrow and say you yeah, i'll put up with it because i'm a soldier of jesus christ no not if sin is so easily available to you the fleshly thing the worldly option is so available to you and the world says skip prayer you know drink alcohol and then the flesh says you know you don't have to go to church you're just so tired you're exhausted stress has gotten over you so don't go to church how can you not how can you not sin isn't it easy to skip the spiritual duty why? We can't help it. Our flesh is under so much pain and sorrow. You know why we react to sin easily? We react very easily to skip our spiritual duty. We make the wrong decisions, the wrong choices. In the words we say, in the actions that we do, is because, is because it's so easy to do. It's because it's so innocent, normal, that everybody does it. It's because that we're under so much pain and stress, so it's understandable I would make this wrong decision. That's why people keep repeating their sinful addictions. That's why people can't get out of a rut. That's why people who are going through trials, it, it's so much pressing for them they cannot overcome. And that's the reason why people, they keep skipping their spiritual duties. They can't stay committed and faithful. Why? It's so hard to do. It's not the normal thing everybody does. It's because if life was easier for me, if I didn't have that pain or that trial, I would do it for the Lord. But because I'm under so much pain and it's hard, God will understand why I can't do that for him. I'll wait till the time is right when things get better, when things get easier, when uh, the trial is passed, then I can serve God more effectively. My next point, verse 47 through 48. We also make wrong reactions based on this passage. Here's the second sin that's committed. 47 through 48, and while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? I always wondered why Jesus asked that question. Jesus Christ could tell Judas, hey, you traitor, <laughs> after he kissed him. Why did Jesus ask a question? Why would you betray me with a kiss? Didn't you know God's that type of person? He's always the type that sometimes will ask you questions because he's trying to get you to think what's going on with your heart. Adam, Adam, where art thou? Why would he do that? Adam gets under conviction so that he can finally get out of his hiding place. See, you're in your hiding place. And God's asking you a question. So he's trying to get Judas to get convicted of his sin here. He's saying, why would you betray me with a kiss? Yeah. I mean, why not just come up to me and say, that's the man, take him. Why would you choose a kiss? Because Judas, see, there's that level of respect there. Yeah. 
even the devils believe and tremble? Even Satan will confess that Jesus is the Lord one day. Even Satan, he has to bow the knee when he goes before the throne and accuses the brethren and receive permission from God. He can't do anything without God's permission. So even the devil has a level of respect. And there's a level of respect there that this is my master. This is the one who gave salvation to people, healed the sick, raised the dead. I mean, this man changed my life and I forsook all to follow him. This is the man, Jesus Christ. Man, what a, man, what a being. This is going to be the Messiah who will bring in the kingdom. And then God just lets you down a little bit here and there. And here you are trying to do a good thing. Trying to do a good thing. We got to use our money wisely because we want to feed the poor. And then Jesus gets on you. No, you have to think about me, not the poor. How inconsiderate of you. You get offended. And you're like, why would Jesus say something like that to me? That was a very mean thing to say. He ought to know that I care about poor people and I care about him. Why would he get on me on that? Ah, because Jesus knows that you've been uh, stealing some things out of the bag. Jesus knows you've been stealing some things that he's given to you and using it wrongly. And then when something bad happens to you in your life, you always go, God, why would you do this to me? So then, there's a level of respect there, but a level of hurt. Hurt because you feel like God let you down, because you feel like that Jesus Christ, uh, you know, you gave him respect, you forsook all to follow him, and Jesus didn't really fulfill your expectations, and Jesus Christ didn't really meet all your needs, and then give you what you can give to him, and then because of that, you can't help but think about, you know what? I can't help but just betray him. But you know what? See, you always have to justify what you're doing wrong because you don't want to make it look that bad. If he's the Messiah, I can see him deliver himself. And when I go over there, I might launch something where Jesus will summon the angels and they'll come down and then he'll set up the kingdom and set them straight. So I'm going to do something like that. So I'll play the bad guy here to help God out because I'm a post-millennial because I believe that I got to help out God in bringing the kingdom. It's got to be something that I got to do. So what I'll do is I'll uh, betray him with a kiss and then let him do something. I can only kiss him because I have such level of respect for him. So... With all that said and done, then Jesus convicts him and shakes him to his knees by saying, why would you betray me through a kiss? Small, small and understandable. Not a big deal. And then what, what do you see in the next verse? The next verse, it caused a reaction. Judas didn't shake up Jesus Christ. He didn't strike Jesus Christ in the face. He just said, hail master and kissed him. That's it. He didn't talk bad about Jesus Christ. And you know what those disciples did? Lord, shall we smite with the sword? Yeah, come on. Yeah. What did it do? It caused a reaction. Where these people thought, oh man, Judas did something right here. We're going to take action. And these people, you know what they did? Then it caused another reaction. One guy said, the, the guy didn't take out the sword and chopped off people's ears. All one guy said was, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And that was just enough motivation for the other guy to hear that and go, yeah, yeah, and then strike the ear. What happened? That guy didn't strike off the ear because of Judas's kiss. That guy striked off the ear because one guy said, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And the guy wouldn't ask, Lord, shall I smite with the sword if it weren't for Judas kissing him? You know what that is? Reaction one, then reaction two becomes a little more extreme. And reaction two didn't sin. 
He didn't kill anyone. He didn't commit murder. But he still sinned because he caused reaction three to commit the sin and, and permanently damage somebody's ear had not Jesus been merciful and cleaned up his mess. And how many times did God clean up your mess from the wrong reaction you had? Yeah, yeah, we, we we're in conviction land now. Don't worry, we have 50 minutes of this miserable feeling left, okay? We have 50 more minutes of this miserable feeling left of conviction. Well, some of you have heard this uh, phrase before. What we do in moderation, others do in what? How can we forget that truth? How can we forget that truth? A lot of times I realize the small things I do, and I've seen it. If I just skip one thing, on. then other people start doing it. Maybe just two or three, and then the whole church starts doing it. So I make a very big deal, all right? I, man, God bless my wife. She's got, she's got to have a lot of patience to marry a person like me. But she, she married into a life of paranoia. <laughs> I feel so bad for her. Some of you may have noticed some glimpses of that. It's not easy. I was prepared to live like the Apostle Paul, you know. <laughs> I was so prepared because she entered into a life where I would make a big deal about little things. You know why? Because I know everybody's looking at us and they're going to do just a little bit more than what we do. And that'll affect the whole church, and they'll do the worst. Good preaching. Good testimony. So I make a big deal about, like, honey, we can't be late. Honey, we can't be late. And then we'll do all this stuff. I'll say, honey, we can't lose our testimony. We can't lose our testimony. Honey, we got to maintain the joy of the Lord. Honey, we got to make sure that uh, we're at peace with ourselves. Yes, your own well-being is important. Why? You can lose your testimony if your well-being is not good. So me and her make a big deal about taking our break time, pacing ourselves when we do something. Why? Any small thing we do, moderately, will be done in excess by other people. You want the biggest uh, evidence? You got kids? It's just moderately what you're doing, aren't you? But kids mistake that for something else, and they do in excess, don't they? That's really big. That's really big. When we look at verse 49, verse 49, verse 49. Pastor, it's not a sin. I never said it was a sin. It's a kiss. Yeah. It's innocent. But kids always take it to the extreme, don't they? Church members always misunderstand the pastor and do it the extreme, don't they? It's just reality. I'm sorry. I wish that I'm lying to you and everything that I said was false. Believe me, I know, because I've entered into this life. I've signed up for this life of paranoia that I hate so much. But that's just reality of 6,000 years of human history that they see one person doing, then they react to the extreme, and the other person acts to the extreme. They hate uh, those poor Russians. They were so upset with those, ar those aristocrats who were abusing their lives, ruling their lives, and they lived like that for centuries. And they couldn't put up with it anymore. And one commie got up and said, let's have equal rights for everybody, equal distribution of wealth. Oh, everybody signed up for that easily. And then now communism took over. Communism was responsible for millions of deaths. Do you understand that? From what? Reaction of a good reason. Yeah. I've been oppressed all my life and I want equality. See, history changes everything from people how they react. You know how you're going to get a reaction from somebody? It's easy to get them to react. You do something in moderation and see what happens to other people, how they will react to you after that. Let's look at verse 49. When they which were about saw him what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? 
And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Man, what a horrible thing, cutting off somebody's ear off. There is no justification for that. You permanently cut off somebody's ear. You hurt them. No excuse. Oh, but you'd be surprised, human nature. They always justify their excuses. You know what would be sad? This is what I believe. I believe even with the damage of you cutting off somebody's ear, you'll still justify what you did. You know why? Because, listen, this might shock you, because we have a right doctrine for it. Okay. What do you mean by that, Pastor? What do you mean by that? Look at those disciples. They made sure that they prayed about it. Uh, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? God never said, yes. Jesus never told them that. The guy who took off his sword and cut off that guy's ears, think Jesus said yes to him. You know what our problem is? I'm sick and tired of this. This makes me stinking angry about Bible believers. Yeah, I'm preaching at my crowd, all right? I'm preaching at my crowd. So no, I'm not biased about my crowd is better than your crowd and our denomination, our churches are better than yours. No, 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 no. When I, when I preach and get mad at sin, the number one person is I'm mad at myself. And the second group is the people that I care about, that, the group that I'm aligned with. So yeah, let me preach at my crowd. I'm sick and tired of them whenever they say, well, let me pray about it. Okay. And I know what that means. What that means is I don't want to do it or I want to do what I want to do. But they have to cover it up with some spiritual cloak. Right. Oh, let me pray about it. No, you, you liar. <laughs> oh, but you're not lying. You know why you're not lying? You did pray about it. But you just didn't hear Jesus say, yes, smite with the sword. You just think that Jesus said yes, that Jesus and God is deciding your decision. Why would God do that, Pastor? We are not honest in our prayer life. We are not honest seeking God's will. And I'm sick and tired of Bible believers pulling up Bible verses, justifying the decisions that they decide, saying the stuff that they say, and doing the things that they do. And they always have a scripture verse for it, just like the devil would. I'm sick and tired of that. Yes, and Bible-believing pastors are guilty of that, I'm sorry to say. That's why I hate this so much, because we know too much. We know that book so much, and how dare we twist it and use it in a way that justifies our flesh. And by the way, you will believe what you're doing is right. Just as much as that disciple cut off that guy's ear. He believed what he did was the right thing. No, he didn't think that I sinned. He believed I did the right thing. You know why? Because there, I, got, I, I got a scripture on that one. I prayed about it and stuff like that. The job that you decide, the way you raise your kids, the way you plan out for your future for your home, who you're going to marry, who you're going to date, every decision you make in the future are you of your own or are you bought with the price and completely yielded by the Holy Spirit guiding you? Okay. You know what that verse says? Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. In other words, God should be full control of everything in your life. You can catch yourself making a wrong decision. You can. You can prevent yourself from being deceived. You can. All you have to do is take this first step. What am I wrong about? Can I repeat that again? Yeah. What am I wrong about? Everyone don't start out that way. They just look at a verse, then they assume they got a right doctrine and they behave the way they behave, say the things that they say and do the things that they do. You have to think. You have to think about what did I do wrong? What am I wrong about? Yeah, the church is crying. The church is reacting now. They don't like this message, right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to the members.
All right, so y'all pray, okay? Hopefully that's not a serious thing, okay? <laughs> but anyway, please pay attention. Don't let the devil distract this message. This is very important. We always have a Bible verse. We always have a doctrine, a spiritual reason. I hope, please listen. I hope you didn't miss what I said. Please listen, all right? We have a spiritual reason for the things that we do. We have a Bible verse. We have a doctrine. And we could probably rightly divide it and justify the decisions that we make even if we cut off somebody's ear off. Okay. To catch yourself and prevent yourself from being deceived that this is God's will, but it turned out it wasn't, is to simply ask yourself, what am I wrong about? Am I repeating some fleshly tendency that I always have? If you were always to start out that way, then you can shield yourself. You can shield yourself. And you can be more confident and have more faith in the decisions that you make. If you are to inspect your flesh first, rather than finding spiritual reasons to justify the decisions you make. When you seek God's will, are you searching for spiritual justifications for it, or are you critiquing your flesh first? Come on. That's good. Next verse, for 49, uh, verse 50 through 51. 50 through 51. And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. You'll notice right here that somebody's ear got cut off. That's no justification like I said to you. No justification. You've permanently damaged somebody's hearing forever. That's a horrible thing that can come out. Why? It's not because the... Dis Do you understand? This disciple who took out his sword and caught off his ear never had the intention of, I just want to hurt somebody's life. But this is one of the worst things that you can see. Somebody's hearing is permanently damaged. He lost his ear. That's such a horrible thing. But see, this guy never thought about that. This guy who cut off his ear ear wasn't thinking about something horrible like that he all he was thinking about was my lord and savior jesus is precious to me more than anything in the world and i love him so much and here are these people and i see these people look at that soldier look at that crowd they have those swords and uh, judas i i never trusted that guy he, he's just, that guy his suspicion what he did proved my suspicion correct and these guys how dare they how dare they lay hands on my Lord? I love Jesus Christ. Don't crucify him. How dare you mock my Savior? These stupid Pharisees and Sadducees. I'm angry at all of them. They were just jealous of my Savior, what he did. And look at them, putting their hands on him. How dare you? And then he cut off some guy's ear and permanently damaged his ear. But this guy was just a servant. He wasn't one of those rough soldiers who put the nails on Jesus' hand. He wasn't the Pharisee or the Sadducee himself. He was just a servant. Yeah, wow. You know why we react wrongly? We react wrongly in how we see the evil or the wrong in people because we're so used to creating things in our own mind of what we experienced. And because of that, those experiences, we use it to confirm our suspicion of the worst in people. Uh, let me give an example, okay, to better illustrate. So let's say that you have a child and you discipline. And then cause me living as a child, I'm using my life as an experience as well. And here you are, you keep repeating a wrong pattern, okay? You keep repeating a wrong pattern, you sin, you mess up, 
Here you are as a parent trying your best because you love the child and because the Bible says you're supposed to strictly discipline them, make them live right for the Lord. So here you are firm in your discipline. Here you are strict on that child and then you try to correct that child. But guess what? My parents ain't perfect. I love them. They raised me to what I am today. But they ain't perfect. And sometimes they really hurt me. Oh, what, what your family? Oh, how, how did that happen? And it happens to everybody's family. Yeah. Why? Because the poor parent has to put up with the child for, what, 18 years or something like that. During that time, they never commit any mistake, right? They never hurt their child once, right? By accident, right? Okay, listen to me. What I'm saying is this. Sometimes I felt hurt by my parents because here I am making a right decision and I didn't do anything wrong. But sometimes the parents, they know this child's behavior pattern because they've seen his history. So sometimes when they see the action that I'm committing, which is not a sin, which is not wrong, they, they conflate that they mistakenly assume that the decision that I made is the same repetitive behavioral pattern of the wrong decisions I made previously. Now, I don't know if that was too deep for you, okay? So this is just a rough example. That's why this is a difficult message. I need examples to better illustrate it. But let's say right here that I have a behavioral history and pattern of being lazy, you know, skipping school or skipping homework and stuff like that. Then God forbid, after 10 years of living my life that way, there was a one situation, one particular situation where I honestly can't do my homework because I am really sick and I am genuinely sick. But then the parent knows my history. Yeah, I've seen you sick, but I know you can do your homework. You're just being lazy. I know you. I saw you for 15 years. You're just doing that again. And then the parent will force me to do the homework. And I get so sick that I get hospitalized after that. Then the parent's heart hurts after that, right? And the parent just feels bad. And they go, oh, man, I, I didn't realize that. I made a wrong decision. Why? Because they reacted wrongly because they thought that their experience of seeing the behavior pattern of that child, that it was right. All right, did this example kind of help? This is very deep, okay? So thank you, thank you. I'm trying to say that. I'm sure uh, my generation understands that. <laughs> I see some of my generation going, yeah, you're exactly right. My parents like that, you know? The point is, you can be wrong, and just because you saw a pattern all that time doesn't mean you're right. Here's another thing. What's dangerous is you're used to seeing something. When you're used to seeing something so much and it proved your suspicion true, you're going to think all of life revolves around what you saw. And that is extremely dangerous. Let me say another one. Another example which is really dangerous which is why I get mad at our Bible-believing brethren, is you think you know it all. Because you know that book from cover to cover, and God, the Holy Spirit, was dealing with your life, and you saw spiritual warfare. You saw how the demons operate, operate and how the Holy Spirit operates, and you're used to having a high, mature spiritual experience. And because of that, that knowledge, if you're not careful, might make a wrong decision. Because you think you know it all. But you know what I've learned? I don't care how much I know. I have to keep critiquing myself. I have to keep looking at my flesh and say, am I making a wrong decision? Am I repeating one of my sinful patterns that I keep doing? That know-it-all thing is extremely dangerous. It's extremely dangerous. That's why, listen, that's why elderly people who have so much wisdom and experienced everything in life, sometimes the elderly people who have that, then they become stubborn. And because they're at that old age, they can't just adapt like young people or change their minds. And sometimes elderly seniors can be the hardest people to put up with or reasonably deal with. Yeah. 
because they think they're right. Why? Because they have more years of experience than we do. They know a lot more things than we do. That know-it-all thing is extremely dangerous. Do you understand? It's extremely dangerous. When I counsel people, it's easy to have a know-it-all mentality after you counsel so many people with similar things. So it's extremely important I always empathize and understand fully first and then help them gradually and let the Holy Spirit reveal it. And something that I say wrongly or do wrongly, if the Holy Spirit shows me something, hey, child, you see that there? You got to back off a bit, then I back off. But who practices such discipline in the middle of counseling or conversations? Who's used to such discipline after acting and behaving and saying this way so many years? That's why elderly people, they can't change who they are. It's hard for them. Do you realize how important this teaching is now? Do you realize, you know what gets on parents so much, which hurts me so much? And I wish it didn't hurt them, but it hurt them so much. A lot of parents suffer guilt. Do you understand that? It's even with lost people. They feel like I could have done better. There's something I did wrong. Well, what did I do wrong? And a lot of times they have to spend their lives encouraging themselves, comforting themselves, because they think about not the sins they committed, but those little small areas that they might have made a mistake on. That's why this preaching is so important. Because you don't realize that someday in the future, your next generations are going to be permanently damaged. And even if it's not your fault, you're still going to connect it to your fault out of guilt. That's why it's so important if you were to say and do everything rightly, and repent of it immediately, then later on in the future, it won't eat you up with so much guilt as before right now. Do you know how many times I have to comfort myself, get rid of my guilt for, if I didn't say this, if I didn't do that, that church member wouldn't have walked away, wouldn't, that church member would still come to this church to this day, and do you know how many times I do that? That's why this is so important. What helped me a lot where I don't do that much anymore is because of this discipline against my flesh and I keep track of it. And this inspection. And that keeps me in peace with God. You know why we react extremely sometimes and then it turned out that we were wrong in our reaction? Because we see in that other person a bit of our own fleshly sins. So then when that person, listen, when that person is doing something wrong and you're like, I know that person's in the wrong, the reason why you say that is because you did the same thing too. And so your assumption comes out that person's in the wrong. How do you know? You don't know their background. You don't know the years that they live, the culture. You don't even know the situation. But I know because that person looked that way, said that way, behaved that way. And actually, my suspicions were confirmed by some of their behavioral patterns back then. You see how dangerous that thing is. Keep behaving that way if you don't like this message and then see your next generations burned and injured. Because every parent, lost or saved, always self-project themselves on their child. And you know it because your generations, your parents did that to you. But guess what? You're no better than your parents. You just repeated what they done. See, what men learn from history is what? If you get this fixed, you can stop a cycle. Do you understand that? That, Do you understand why kids are the most important to me? I want to stop this cycle. And God blessed us with three beautiful babies. Amen. For their sake, 
I sure don't want this cycle to continue. Amen. Wow. Let's look at verse 52. Oh my goodness. The time flew. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Verse 52, my, so I, I don't have my watch here. <laughs> I lost it, actually. I'm going to put this right here. That way I don't make a mistake. This clock is dead, and I don't trust that clock. <laughs> All, right, so. All right, it's a weird thing I have, so let me put that clock there. Verse, but like I said, do you understand how many months we can get into this topic? There's so much to learn and glean here. Verse 52 through 53. Now, this one is pretty powerful that I want us to keep in mind. The Bible says, Then Jesus said unto the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders which were come to him, Be come out as against a thief with swords and staves. When I was daily with you in the temple, he stretched forth no hands against me. You know what Jesus said to those soldiers? He said during that whole time, you didn't react wrongly. You didn't come here with swords and staves and arrested me throughout that whole time. They never reacted wrongly until now. So why now bring your sword and staves? Why now react wrongly? Because that last part is eye-opening. That verse says, the last part, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. You know what that means? But this is your hour? That's showing right there that even though you never came out with sword and staves against me, you never committed that wrong reaction all these years, you had it in your heart. Uh -huh. You're just waiting for the right time. Yeah. Only time will tell until that wrong reaction in your heart will come out. Yeah. You know, the wrong reactions, you're not committing it. And praise the Lord, you're not committing it, but it's in your heart. And for years it's sitting you got it under control, and you think that it's not going to come out, but wait till the power of darkness sets in, and that devil saw your history of your behavioral patterns all that time, and he's waiting for the right moment to come out, and at that right moment that comes out, good luck with your spiritual warfare when all the powers of hell get onto you with that thing that you kept hidden in your heart if that wasn't eliminated a long time ago and they're going to put all you bet your power get this now get this now you bet you all the powers of hell are going to aim at that one weak spot that's hidden hidden in the corner of your heart you bet on it one day it'll happen even though all these Years it never happened. Lord, help us. Help us. You know what that's, that is? You know how you react? By doing nothing. Wow. By doing nothing. What is nothing? Like doing nothing. What happens is this. If you're not alert, and if you don't self-inspect yourself, if you don't constantly find the things that you need to get right with God, and if you don't comfort your heart, encourage yourself in the things that you do for the Lord, if you don't always spiritually inspect yourself, spiritually grow, spiritually in the battle, what happens is when you're living just like you're doing right now, just going about every day, living up normal life, that's an example of you not keeping track with how, what you say and what you behave. But guess who's been keeping track? The devil. And the devil goes, ah, I see that he has a tendency to do this. I see that his favorites are this and this and this. I see that her dislikes are this and this and this. And you and I don't keep track of 30-something years of how we behave and live, but the powers of darkness kept a good track of that. And what they're going to do is wait for the right time and use all those things and get at you. And you're like, how did this happen? But wouldn't the powers of darkness have a harder time if the things that they checkmarked were already surrendered to God? Whatsoever ye eat and drink, and whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Amen. 
That includes even your very own driving. Yeah. Uh, wow. You know why? I lost my testimony before. Ask Brother Tom. I, I just confessed my sin. All right. <laughs> Ask Brother Tom. Even just driving. I'm so used to getting to church on time. I'm so used to making the time. I'm so used to, you know, driving carefully. I'm so used to just driving so many times, so many times, so many times, and the devil saw my behavioral pattern. Ah, Gene, he likes to speed up this way. He thinks about this about the drivers. And then, you know, he drives this way for some weird reason. And, and then just that one time, just that one time, and then I was afraid and I almost did something wrong in the driving where I could have permanently damaged somebody's property. And then my cuss word came out, and Brother Tom was sitting right next to me. <laughs> the Bible... The Bible says there was silence in heaven for the space of half an hour. I stopped my car. I went... And I looked at Brother Tom. Brother Tom, just smile. <laughs> and I said, I'm, and then I said all the stuff. I'm so sorry, brother. I'm like, blah, blah, blah. I'm so sorry. And, you know, I'm, I'm not usually like this, blah, blah, blah. And Brother Tom's like, that's okay, Pastor. We're all flesh. Oh, I was like, oh, thank you, God. Thank you, God. He was fresh out of Catholicism, too. <laughs> just getting to know the Bible believing movement. And he had to put up with Sean's craziness and Chuck's, you know, laughter and loudness. And I was like, oh, thank God for an understanding guy like Tom. What did that, well, it's not, uh, we laugh about it, but you see what the devil, that crafty, sneaky snake can do from something that you're so used to doing every single day. Just do nothing. I promise you this. You know how to sin? You know how to end up like one of those people on the street and get sucked up on drugs and become one of those extreme liberals cussing out Jesus' name? It's very easy. Do nothing for God. Get out of church for years. Get out of Bible reading and prayer for years. And let backsliding gradually process its toll. Don't worry. You don't have to work hard to sin. You don't have to work hard to become an extreme liberal atheist. You don't have to work hard to get on that drug addiction. Baby, let the unclean spirit fill your life and do its work and just yield to every time the flesh wants something small and it'll gradually, automatically make you the worst sinner out of everybody. Keep up the good work. Do nothing. Last point. Verse 54. Whew, that was heavy. All right. I, I'm going to be done with this one. All right, verse 54. Psychologically draining, isn't it? This one could be emotionally draining too, but this is so important. Verse 54. Then took they him and led him and brought him into the high priest's office. And Peter followed afar off. That is not Peter's normal reaction. Do you realize that? His normal reaction, he was the one that cut off that guy's ear. Do you see a total 180 in less than five minutes? You know what the problem is if you commit wrong reactions? You still commit the wrong reaction after that. What do I mean by that? Here I committed the wrong action of cutting somebody's ear off. And, man, I got traumatized by that. Man, that was so stupid and wrong of me. So I might as well repent, get right with God, and then try to live for Jesus Christ. No! It causes you to, to, to do the other extreme, out of balance, the opposite reaction, which is I'm scared to take a stand for Jesus Christ. So I'll follow Jesus. I'm still following Jesus, but from a distance. That's reactionary theology from Pastor Knowles. Wow. But he only concentrated on theology, doctrine. What about your everyday living? A false balance is an abomination to the Lord. Here you are 
fervent in your spiritual duty, serving Jesus Christ, soul winning, and then reading the Bible, praying, and then coming to church faithfully, participating and helping out the pastor, and then contributing any skill, anything that you've got for the Lord, and just staying faithful, spiritually, faithfully keeping your duties. And then that reaction, if not kept in balance, causes the extreme of you become a burden to other people. But I'm so winning. I'm living for Jesus. The, the, the loved ones should know better. No, no, no. You got to be gentle with them. You got to be understanding. And you got to take patience with them. But see, when we make a mistake and a wrong reaction from our spiritual duty, from our spiritual zeal, it tends to make us do the extreme of settling down more with the world. So here we are, and we're trying to, uh, well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm doing bad in my workplace. I'm doing bad in my job because I spent so much focus on my spiritual duties for God. I've learned my serious lesson. I've got to focus in my workplace. And then when you start doing that, then your spiritual duties backslide. And then you're more infatuated with work because you've got to make a living. You've got to take care of your family. And it caused you to go to the other extreme of not doing as much spiritual duties for God. Because why? Because you have to take care of your family. You have to make money. Because job's important. Because pastor told me so. He corrected my spiritual zeal. So I got to focus on my loved one, my family, and my work. And use that as your excuse to go to the extreme reaction of being bound to this earth. And now you became earthly minded. Now you're thinking about a better home. You're thinking about more money. You're thinking about a better pay raise and a promotion. And trying to please everybody. And making sure everybody loves you. When we try to discipline our children, the problem is, is that if we don't keep ourselves in line, we might not take control of our sin of anger and lash out at that child, and that child is permanently scarred and will remember what you did against him or her. And they're, gonna use the ex and they're going to use the excuses that, well, you were hard and disciplined. You, you justified yourself with scripture and you have good spiritual reasons to discipline me that way and then you start and tarred your child's life in the future because you're going to keep track of your fleshly anger. Come on. So you didn't know, you didn't discipline that child. You corrected that child because you were so angry and you couldn't put up with that child anymore and then your flesh couldn't take control and then you lashed out more than you shouldn't have lashed out. You permanently scarred that child. And then because... You committed that wrong reaction. You get traumatized, you get scared, and you go to the other wrong reaction of now spoiling the children, of now losing responsibility, not keeping track of your child, and then not like, uh, well, you know, I hurt that child. I can't do that again. I'll never do it again. And then now you've gotten so light now that the children have become spoiled and you lack responsibility. You can't take charge. You can't discipline them. You know, uh, the problem with Christians is that we get bound by the spiritual things that we do for the Lord and the mistakes that we made, we've learned our lessons from them. And so because of that, it caused us to behave and say things in a way where we don't repeat our mistakes again. But then you see somebody else there doing things that seem to line up with your mistakes you committed. And then what ha happens is if you're not careful, you judge them wrongly. You think of them wrongly. And you even, I hope that the preachers are hearing this, you even preach against them wrongly. And you don't realize how many members you traumatized and hurt and how many other good, godly, Bible-believing labors you permanently damaged and hurt because you self-projected. Yeah, amen. 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 I better hear amens on that one. You know, Bible-believing preachers have so much pride. They think that they forget Romans 14. 
and they always be a stumbling block to other brethren because how the Lord dealt with me in my spiritual journey got me right with God with my sins and my mistakes. You guys are doing that too, so I better correct you. No, maybe they're from a different culture. They're from a different location than you. And maybe it's because uh, the way God is dealing with them is different from how God is dealing with you. Yeah, amen. Park it right there. Amen. Amen. Don't get me wrong. If it violates the word of God, if the word of God, it is plain sin and plain wrong doctrine, I'm going to call it out and you're wrong. Right. But a lot of people don't understand a lot of things that we do in life is abstract that you can't say to them it's right and wrong. You just have to leave it up to the Lord and then deal and it's everybody's own Amen. spiritual conviction. Amen. You know what I'm terrified of the most? Sometimes I'm, what I'm scared of the most more than, whew, more than getting punished, more than the judgment seat of Christ, is something horrible, wow. horrible, atrocious that nobody would commit, like cutting off somebody's ear. Like something horrible, a horrible act like that would be committed by me, but I had no idea that I would do that. Think about sometime after this sermon, this preaching, what horrible acts you are capable to commit that you have no idea you will do. That's deep, isn't it? That's serious. You got, if God delays the rapture further, you got plenty of years left for the devil to work on you to get you to commit some kind of horrible, atrocious act. You got plenty of time, and you and I have no idea. If you and I knew about it, we'd probably all commit suicide, right? That's me in the future? I don't want to make that mistake. What a horrible mistake. <laughs> Lord, take me home. But you and I are capable, and we will in the future. You are going to say things that will be a permanent scar and damage you'll never take back. And it's written in history books. You will commit actions that inflicted pain on somebody's life that you can't take back. There's going to be something horrible you will accidentally even say and do. It's inevitable with everybody. Inevitable! Because that's the nature of sin and human nature. It's inevitable. And it'll happen to all of us. But the thing that we don't think about, the weight we don't think about is somebody never came back to this church because of something that I did that I didn't realize was that serious. I said and did something where someone I deeply loved, someone I love, because of what I did, they can't trust me as much as before. Because of something that I did, I didn't realize it had that much heavy weight. Pastor's gone, and he won't come back to continue pastoring this church. Because of something, this is worse. This is worse. Because of something that I did, I didn't realize the full weight and scale of this, that these three babies born in our church, and that our future generations have now lived their lives out in sin, and never understand the joy of the Lord like I experienced. Never understood how wicked the world is out there like I experienced. And that we permanently scar not just our own next generation, but for ten generations to come if God delays a rapture. And that's inevitable in history. Every head bow and every eye shut.